let's look at the supply side. So the, the trends are obvious. There's more people. There's more wealth. Absent uh, economic cycles, which we may be, we may be going through now, courtesy of the Fed. Uh, on average, uh, the world has grown in wealth, and it's grown in its consumption of energy. This is a very a very simple graph, it's common in every text or article. It's not hard to find the data, whether you're using IEA data or EIA data or World Bank data. Uh, what this tells you is that over the last uh, 30 years, uh, the world's overall consumption of energy has increased rather substantially. Uh, the quantity of hydrocarbons consumed in absolute terms has increased by an amount equal to, in energy equivalent terms, adding six Saudi Arabia's worth of energy supply. Uh, what's also happened over that time is we've spent a lot of money on non-hydrocarbon energy sources. The world has spent somewhere between five and ten trillion dollars since the year 2000 to avoid using hydrocarbons. You can see the evidence of an energy transition in this. Is it there? I mean, if, after 20 years of climate awareness uh, and on the order of ten trillion dollars of of, ag of aggregate spending in the Western world to avoid hydrocarbons. Most of this has been on wind and solar. A lot of it's been on ethanol and biofuels. Some, some has been on hydro, but most of it's been wind and solar. Uh, what you see is that the world today has about 3% of its energy supply from wind and solar. As, as a framing point for why I say that the, the energy transitions are slow and that it's delusional to think that we're in a rapid transition, I mean, obvious, I offer this graph as exhibit A, that there's no rapid transition going on. That is, this data do not show any evidence of a quote, rapid transition. More importantly, in terms of the challenge of the magnitude of you know, changing how the world uses energy at, at the macro level, wood, burning wood, not wood as a, as a construction material, burning wood today globally supplies three times more energy than all the world's wind and solar utility scale and consumer installations combined. Even in the United States, uh, burning wood for energy is 50% uh, of wind and solar. If you compared wood to just solar, by the way, wood, wood currently supplies more energy than solar arrays in America. That, that'll change. The wood share will shrink. In absolute terms, by the way, the quantity of wood energy used today to supply the world isn't much different than it was 100 years ago. It's just the world's a lot bigger. So you don't have energy transitions. You have you have energy additions over time, which is what, if you drew this further back in history, you would see the same phenomenology. It is unequivocally the case that the share of wind and solar will keep rising. Now, we're gonna, we've spent a lot of money on it. We're going to keep spending lots more money on it. The technologies are better than they ever were. They're getting they're getting better uh, uh, and will continue to get better. We will, we will see that wedge expand, but that's not an accelerating transition. So what we have instead are... Um, aspirations as opposed to uh, actual performance. This is just looking just at the U United States in terms of the expectation for accelerating a transition away from hydrocarbons towards renewables broadly. Uh, renewables being not just wind and solar in this case, but also hydropower uh, and uh, wood and ethanol and biofuels. This is US, the red line is the share of US energy coming from renewables. And as you can see, it's risen uh, significantly uh, in the last two decades. And that uh, about a third of that is ethanol. And the two thirds of the rest of that increase in the share of renewable energy is in fact, wind and solar. Uh, the dotted lines are forecasts that were made by smart people, uh, serious uh, people, organizations uh, over the past uh, 40 years. The beginning of the dotted line is the year the forecast was made, and the end of the dotted line is the forecast for the share of U.S. energy that would come from renewables made by each organization or person at the point they did it. So now what you can see from that is, is, is sort of self-evident in the illustration. Uh, the aspirations or forecasts for the increased share of renewable energies were vastly more uh, optimistic and enthusiastic than what actually happened. So, you know, I guess the question you'd have to ask is this time different? I mean, we now, we're now into, you know, 2022, 23, we've going to spend a lot of money <clears throat> on, on the Green New Deal as, as it's been, you know, framed as a, a short form for the, the uh, energy transition. Uh, are we going to get to in 20 years, 25 years, 
more than half of U.S. energy coming from renewables. And most of that is going to be wind and solar in terms of how the money is planned to be deployed. I mean, if, if you saw a graph like, graph like this, and this was, um, you know, investment advisors telling you what your in return on investment would be at any given time, and they'd failed this abysmally, you probably wouldn't trust them anymore. But when it comes to energy forecasts, we don't have quite the same standards for credibility, uh, but that's the nature of the beast. So let's turn this turn this uh, to a global perspective uh, in terms of forecasts of the need. This is aspirational again, and uh, but the need to, to use uh, to supply more of the world's energy from non non hydrocarbons from carbon free energy sources and carbon free. This, this is to be clear again. The International Energy Agency's forecasts and all the forecasts that are baked into every country that's making pledges. They're dominated by wind, solar, and batteries. So the forecast energy supply for the world are not hydrogen and hydro dams and nuclear power. 75% of all the net energy uh, supply growth that is forecast to come in the energy transition is anchored in more wind and more solar with batteries to mediate it. That's, it's, a, it's basically a wind solar story. It's not a hydrogen story. It's not a nuclear story. That's where the money is, it's where the subsidies are, it's where the aspirations are. But set aside the source of energy, just in terms of asking a question, is it reasonable to expect this time that we could achieve a, an acceleration like the previous forecast? So to get to net zero, to have 100% of the world's energy to come from non-hydrocarbons by 2050, not the 2040s and the 2030s, but by 2050, 30 years out. Uh, you could look at this as a construction issue because all energy machines have to be built. Doesn't matter whether you're building gas turbines or wind turbines, you know, solar arrays or you know coal plants. It, make, it makes no difference. Everything involves steel, glass, metals, and construction equipment and backhoes and welding. And you have to build stuff. You have to build a lot of things. So what you'd want to know is whether or not it's reasonable to expect this level of construction were even possible from where we are today to say 2050. To calibrate that in terms of the construction demands, the physical demands on the construction industry, uh, think of this in this way. To go from where we are today to get to 100% non-carbon non energy, if we did it with windmills as a way to get a framing for the magnitude of construction required, you'd have to build, a th you'd have to build and install a thousand three megawatt windmills. The three megawatt ones are the size of the Washington Monument. So you need to build and install a thousand of those every day for 30 years, a thousand of them every day for 30 years, or put it put in broader terms, the you'd have to build and install every year a quantity of wind turbines that already exist globally. So all of the all of the wind turbines that have been built over the last 20 years would have to build that much every year now for 30 years to get to this point. 